case, uh, Matt, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, I, my name's Matt, and also with Edge Case, I'm Jim's security <coughs> assistant there. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's my hacker yeah. that I'm going to use in these demos. So we're going to talk about securing your Rails system. How many people here feel that the Rails application is 100% secure? <laughs> Uh, appropriate amount of laughter. I like Why that. It's not running. <laughs> it's not running. That's really the Rails app is the one that is not running at this time. Okay. I got really interested in security on Rails. Essentially last fall, when I read this article uh, by Patrick McKenzie, he took a look at the Diaspora uh, source code base. Uh, Diaspora, if you're not familiar with it, is a, is a Facebook re uh, replacement intended to be um, uh, support all kinds of your, your, your privacy concerns and be very private. So he thought, well, let's look at it from a security standpoint. And it was very interesting what he found out. He discovered that there were numerous security issues in the code base. And essentially, that uh, there was nothing that you could not do with someone's diaspora account. Absolutely nothing. In other words, it was totally open uh, with some very simple hacks. That made me start thinking. How secure is my Rails application? Now, I've done through all the normal security training that a lot of web developers get. How many people have had any security training at all? Okay, let's, let's reverse that. How many people have not had any security training? Okay, now that's really interesting. Um, it's, it's kind of scary, too. Hackers don't think like we do. Now this is actually, I have a program with a guy who's working on his master's thesis right now. And this program here, this is a recording live from last Tuesday. He is monitoring the power output or the power usage of a chip and presenting it with several keys. And since it takes more bits or more power to flip the bits, he can tell how close he is to getting the right password. And within about 25 or 30 iterations, he deduces the 64-bit uh, password. He, uh, is he getting it yet? He's within one digit of it. Almost. Almost. Yeah, I think he's got it there. We'll stop here in a second. Essentially, he figured out the password was the hex code dead beef duplicates. <laughs> yes. This is awesome. But he does it by monitoring the power bits on a chip. And this is actually a chip uh, that you use to unlock your car. You know, little remote unlockers? He could figure out the encryption code on that chip by monitoring the power of that. That's weird. Who thinks of things like that? <laughs> I certainly don't. I'm very much a happy path programmer. And I just assume that uh, you know, Rails works like it should and, and it's, it's certainly fairly secure. And this was kind of my little research into some of the things that go on. And, um, I'm no different uh, than Jim in that regard. You know, I'm not, so I'm not you know, claiming to be a security expert. Um, so you know, for those of us who don't necessarily have that uh, as background, there's a little bit of uh, reading homework if you haven't read it. Um, obviously, you know, the Rails guys are good stuff, but if you're going to security guys are particularly good. It has uh, a lot of uh, really valuable information about what are some of the built-in features of Rails uh, that do protect our applications? Um, and this is actually extracted um, from a larger uh, document. Um, and I, uh, I can't really I, I pronounce uh, Sean's name correctly. Uh, Heiko Weber's, I think, but uh, uh, for OWASP, which is the uh, Open Web Application Security Project, um, that uh, does things like monitoring the top ten you know, exploits in the wild and things like that. Um, but it's, it's a it's a reasonably short document, it's about 48 pages. If you haven't read it, um, definitely do so. He calls reasonably short 48 pages. That was sure. a long document to me. <laughs> it, it, it's it's, it's unbearable not to read it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we're here you know, to talk a little bit about the basics and what kind of the, the, um, the standard stuff that's out there in the wild that uh, you may not be thinking about, um, but that all applications are kind of um, going to be subject to. Uh, so, let's take for the uh, sake of argument, this is kind of a, a base, a very uh, simple representation of what uh, a web application architecture, a uh, straightforward web app architecture would look like. Um, you know, obviously we have the browser, um, we have a web app server that's running our Rails code, the application we've written, and more likely than not, it's talking to the database. Um, so, 
for the purpose of this, of this talk, we're talking about topics that are, uh, deal with, um, you know, application security. We're not talking about system administration security. We're not talking about security or server. Um, but for the sake of argument here, um, of these three general sections, you know, what sections can you sort of as <coughs> what, what, what can you trust? Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, that's a good answer. Like people yeah. in the audience, I like that. <laughs> okay, but uh, so you know, so can you trust the browser? And of course, you know, no, right? You can't trust user input. Um, and can you trust the database? No, that's where user input uh, gets stored. Right? Uh, so we'll look at various ways that uh, uh, problem areas or that uh, issues that can come up uh, if you're doing either of those things. So let's talk about the very first basic thing that you will cover if you take any kind of security course. That's SQL injection. Uh, suppose you have a query that looks like this. This is a very basic Rails query. We're using a conditions thing, and we're looking for a name that matches you know, some kind of filter test. And we want to make sure that we're not getting any admins in this list. So we want to just get a list of normal users whose username matches some kind of filter. And uh, I want to point out this. This is bad. Anybody do this in a Rails code? No. Now, fortunately, Rails has made it very easy to not do this. So if you are still doing things like interpolating tests directly into the conditions, or any time you build SQL by hand, it's a danger of doing this. So be aware. Uh, but Matt, why don't you demonstrate for us what could happen if you make that horrible, horrible mistake? Sure. So I'll, I'll show real quick. Uh, so we yeah, have just a, a simple app. Uh, we'll look at a couple times here, but it's uh, for scheduling movie nights with your friends. Right? Um, and for the purposes of that app, we've got a, a little a screen here that's showing some of the current users in the, in the app that I have access to see uh, their basic information here. And a simple filtering form on these. So if I want to filter uh, the users that, uh, that I'm able to see. So I'll filter based off of Jerry. I, I only see Jerry's. Um, and we can see here that um, we're noticing that we've got, it's injected into the, the query param parameters uh, on the string, the query string, this filter equal Jerry uh, uh, query param, which could indicate uh, that there's a potential right there that uh, maybe for a, a, a SQL injection opportunity. Right. So if I, if I decide that maybe I want something that's a little bit more complex here, um, and perhaps too complex for my own good. So, yeah, common drop tables. <laughs> 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 This is, this is what I'm talking about. My, my live coding sheet. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay, so and now uh, some of the seeing uh, much more users than we had previously. Um, Show us all the administrative passwords for which there were no admins. We, uh... Yeah, it turns out that on SQL injection, you can inject any kind of SQL you want into the table. Uh, the more complex query that he tried would actually go into the table and print out the um, hashed password for all the administrators. So that's quite scary. So don't do this. Don't put the uh, SQL injection, uh, don't interpolate it into your SQL. And just kind of I'm just going to go through this really fast. This was a long, longer talk. I'm kind of going to try and fit down into your 30-minute uh, time span here. Um, and my remote, there we go. And so essentially, it means uh, 
we inject extra code into the SQL statement just like that. The key to this is to use the question mark syntax in your conditions and let Rails stick that in and it will do it safely for you. And it will quote things that should be quoted. And not, the, the advantage of this not, is not only will this prevent SQL ejections, it will allow names like O'Brien with an apostrophe to uh, work correctly in your, in your uh, filter. Um, 
And this is a balanced attack from both the browser side and the database side. The key is to get data into your database that you did not expect. Uh, would you like to demo this one? Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. It uh, sounds so popular. Increasingly there. No. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a movie night creation. So I'm going to go ahead and schedule a night that I want to see an awesome movie with my friends. Uh, we'll go ahead and have it at the back cave. Then should bring some beer. Um, and notes might be something like, uh, you know, maybe I, I want to uh, have the ability to say, to put bold, you know, don't bring light beer in my, in my notes to my friends right now. Uh, but I can also try something, you know, like, well, if I can get a bold tag here, maybe I get something else in here. I, I really want to point out to them, you know, no light beer. <laughs> and I try that and see if that's going to get my message across. Schedule tonight. Not there. Oh, yeah. There it is. Okay. <laughs> so technically, what have I done there? I've embedded some JavaScript into a form and some redisplay into the page. Now remember, this is in the database now, so anybody who views this page will execute this JavaScript. And that's you know okay, and that's that's a neat framework. It's but it seems relatively innocuous. Um, you know, okay. Uh, but look, I can do something slightly, uh, slightly more complex with a little bit of luck. Um, I'll try something else, and I will instead do a, uh, a document dot write through an image tag, uh, in, and uh, onto the image, uh, onto the end of the URL, the source attribute for that image, uh, I'm going to append a cookie value. Okay. Let's see what we get back. Uh, now, if I schedule that night. Uh, see, well, it's an, a broken image tag, right? It's something didn't load, but, but what did happen? You see all of those all the time, right? Yeah, it happens from time to time. If you go back over to a server log, it's just, just a, a simple Rails app that I, I constructed here. You can see that it came, a request came through, and into that request included all of the cookie data, which in this case includes the session data, um, that is in to some other random uh, you know, malicious server's web log. And that's obviously that can be a problem. But just think about that for a second. By just putting arbitrary JavaScript into the form, he was able to, uh, to the user, make it look like, oh, there's just a bad image in this, uh, in this uh, form, and not think much about it. I mean, I see bad image tags all the time. But all that image tag really did was go out to another server running somewhere else and send the cookie data for the session to that service. And the user never even saw it happen. He never was aware that that cookie data went out. And that cookie is the key to controlling your account on that application because he's got all the session information. Once he gets the session cookie, he can take over your account. Okay. So, this all came from the fact that we wanted to display, allow the user to put things like bold um, markup characters into that form. So to do this, we put raw right in here. This is a Rails 3 thing. So by default, Rails will sanitize all your HTML, which is good. That's a good thing that uh, it does. But to bypass that, use the raw command. This is opposite from Rails 2, where you had to put the H in all your output to make sure it was sanitized. Um, the problem is the raw. You don't want to be using raw if you can avoid it. Um, and why would you want to? Well, you want a lot of markup. You might want to use something like uh, Textile or Markdown, which produces HTML. You want that to go through. Or maybe you just forgot to use the H if you're using an old Rails version. So solution number one, just don't do that. Don't use raw. But if you need to allow markup, use a whitelist of allowed markup that can go on that output page. Don't use a blacklist. Don't say what should be taken out, what should not be allowed. And don't try to correct. For example, if you have input like this, and you decide, well, we will just remove all these script commands from that user input, and then it will be safe, right? Unless the user does this. So if you've got bad markup, don't allow it. Don't try to correct it, just disallow it entirely. OK. Uh, JavaScript can happen in places you have no idea, where you would not normally expect it. For example, an href on an anchor tag, yeah, fairly common, but the background field on a table, 
you check all of those? The key here is if you're going to be doing this, use the sanitized helper method in Rails. This is actually pretty good. If you're going to write a whitelister, use the sanitized method in Rails. It is better written than what you would come up with yourself, most likely. Okay. Mistaking authentication for authorization. This is something I discovered that I do myself all the time in Rails programs, and now I'm aware of it and correcting it. Suppose you have this. You uh, want to look up a knight. So you say, okay, let's, uh, the, the knight ID comes in on a parameter, and you just look up the knight and you pass it in. Okay, the issue here is you might not allow the might not be allowed to see that particular knight in the database. That might be a knight that belongs to a user that you're not friends with, that he doesn't want, it might be private. But we have nothing in here to protect it, and it comes right off the params list, which is totally unprotected. Mm -hmm. That uh, anybody could inject anything into that number right there. A better way to do this is to scope the query using the current user. So if you say current user dot knights dot find, and then pass that in, you will not be able to find any knights that do not belong to the current user. Now, I've resisted using finders on association, mainly because I like to think of uh, my objects as objects and not think about them as, as database objects until the very last moment. So I tend to avoid the syntax, because this makes it obvious the association is stored in a database. But because of this, I'm changing my coding habits to, uh, to avoid uh, the scoping issue. Um, the, the more complex uh, scenarios, um, just you know, have, having proper scope finders is a, is a basic fix, but you might have more complex authorization issues um, that, that um, you know, it might be uh, more difficult to manage, in which case pulling in and plugging in something like uh, Ryan Bates' uh, Can Can, which is a, a, recent, uh, a, re a recent addition to that uh, arena. Who um, uses Can Can? Yeah. All right, very good. Um, can uh, give you a more robust approach to uh, you know, proper optimization. This is an interesting one. Cross-site request forgery. How many people know what this is? <laughs> you are an educa educated group here. I was kind of aware of what it was, and I knew that because of this, Rails was sticking funky things in the forums. <laughs> but I wasn't quite really sure why it was sticking these funky things in. But consider the scenario. Uh, up there we have a hacker web page, and down here we have our movie night website. And you, uh, you're currently logged into the movie site. And, but um, in a uh, spat of inattention, you decide to browse the web a little bit, and you find a link that takes you to this hacker web page. And you uh, download a page from that, and embedded in that page is an image request. that says movienight.com slash night1 destroy. <laughs> the browser sees that as an image request and immediately sends that URL to Movie Night. What happens? Well, if there's no protection in place, uh, you delete that night. This is cross-site request forgery. We're forging a request to the site from a different website. And you say, well, we should be restful. A get on an image should not cause uh, things to be deleted from our database. And we follow, if we follow restful rules, we should be fine, right? Maybe. Because the thing can be much more complicated than you had uh, suspected. So this actually will do a post and will actually delete it as well. The key to this is that Rails will inject an authenticity token into your forms. And this token is something that Rails knows about. He records it so that when your forms come in, and you make a request like this, that if you do not have the proper authenticity token in your form, Rails will say failure, it's not found, or it's the invalid one, and it will deny the request. So that is the protection against cross-site request forgery. And now you know why the funky authenticity token is in all your forms. You have to uh, use the Rails helper to generate that, but it's do that in the forms that you generate. If you generate a form by hand, make sure you get that authenticity token in there somehow. Okay. Key thing to remember here, that the 
authenticity token buys you nothing if you allow cross-site scripting. Because cross-site scripting attack can walk your page with JavaScript, find the authenticity token, and still submit it. This is a real danger. There are sites that have lost um, great deals of money because of attacks like this. There was a, a credit card uh, thing in Mexico where they actually embedded some stuff in routers, and the routers would download things, or they, they were able to program the routers through uh, attacks like this and redirect the uh, DNS things from uh, the Mexican banks to their own websites. And you can imagine the problems that would cause. Would you like to talk about session spoofing? Uh, I would like to talk about session spoofing because the next image uh, is pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we removed spider sheep uh, going around, right? This was uh, uh, a nifty utility that you can install as a browser plugin to uh, let you kind of view the active ongoing uh, sessions for a person's reality on popular social media sites like Facebook and, and Twitter. Uh, uh, Flicker and things like that. Um, not going to do a demo of that right now, but you know. It, and you can thank him for that. <laughs> Those yeah. of you who are logged on to the public Wi Fi right now will thank him. Indeed. Um, but uh, but what are some, some, that's obviously a very serious issue. Uh, and it, and it's, uh, thankfully, it didn't, you know, the intent was to, to engender some really good discussion on the topic. Um, this is you know, a known exploit in that uh, session spoofing has been known for quite some time. Uh, but uh, in the aftermath of that, you know, start talking about uh, you know, what can be done. Uh, one require SSL. Like in, in this day and age, uh, you know, 2011, uh, you know, requiring SSL by, by default for any authenticated sessions uh, is is a prudent choice. Right, it's the way to go. Uh, uh, part of that, you also will need to make sure you're using secure cookies. Uh, so cookies, uh, you know. Obviously, cookies that are a secure session, uh, your, your, uh, your uh, you know, session token, for example, uh, is going to need to be protected. Uh, but if a, if, even if you're doing a redirect, so if someone goes to log into your site or goes to, uh, to authenticate themselves to your site over HTTP and you redirect them to HTTPS, well, they're already going to have transmitted their cookies or so be clear on that first connection attempt prior to the redirect unless the cookies have been explicitly marked as secure. In which case, there won't be some of the rest of the um, a, a new and a, a burgeoning, uh, hopefully, potential standard right now is the strict transport security. Uh, there's a link to uh, the IETF document um, here, and there'll be in the slides. Um, but basically, it's a, uh, it's a new server header, uh, which the server can instruct a browser that it must uh, perform communications over uh, SSL and TLS. How can you bring that into your apps right now? Um, Rack SSL uh, is a Rack malware written by Josh Key that basically will um, uh, enforce these and require those, those um, uh, require SSL. It will mark all cookies secure automatically and will send that uh, the header down uh, for all requests. Um, so just happened just a couple days ago. I'm sure um, a lot of people probably most of us noticed it, but uh, Twitter added an option. Uh, that you can configure uh, to uh, restrict, you know, by your account that you only go over SSL, always use HTTPS. And that's a great thing. Uh, obviously, in the aftermath of Firesheet, uh, Twitter was one of the, the services that was sort of, uh, you know, uh, exploited on that. Um, it would be great to see, you know, perhaps the next step um, to do away with it being an option, right? Because currently it's, it's off by default. Um, Gmail, you know, Google Web Services did this a while back. You know, Back, um, there was a point where not where you could choose to restrict um, your Gmail account to SSL. Um, now it's always SSL. So hopefully uh, that that move will be made um, to as well. Okay, let's talk the summary really quick here. We're gonna go. Through, we have 44 seconds left for the summary. Trust nothing. Stay up to date on the security patches. This is a big thing. Rails constantly fixes security holes that they find. So stay up to date on that, and you'll be much better off. Um, a lot of the hacks, the demos that we did today, we had to explicitly bypass the defaults that Rails built in for us. We had to bypass raw. We had to do special things to be able to access the cookie from uh, JavaScript. Rails, by default, is doing actually a 
fairly decent job. But like your job is to make sure you don't pull the uh, the uh, bonehead moves of interpolating into SQL queries and things like that. Always scope your finds by the proper privileges. Avoid using raw, or at least sanitize your HTML. Do a security audit. How many people uh, have done a security audit on their code? We've done a couple on some of ours, and it was very interesting what came back. I highly, highly recommend finding a good security firm that knows what they're doing and have your code audited. Uh, just be aware. Think like a hacker. They don't think like you. They don't think about the happy path. They think of the corner cases. And consider that when you're building your web app that you don't automatically build things in. Thank you very much.